a very best-selling book that around 15, 20 years ago, it really became a global bestseller and it is called The Languages of Love. But this author is obviously not a Muslim. He's writing as a psychologist, a therapist. He's written from his own experiences something that is called the languages of love. These are five languages of love. I have read this book and I have summarized and Islamicized, gone through it, and I have found Quran and Sunnah. What he discovered was that people express and receive love in different ways. And a lot of times, one of the spouses is expressing love, but the other spouse the language that they want to receive the love in is different than the language the spouse is expressing. And he gives a simple example. Imagine if one, if the wife speaks Japanese and the husband speaks Swahili. And the wife is saying, I love you in Japanese. And the husband doesn't speak Japanese, he speaks Swahili. So she can say a million times, I love you, I love you, I love you. And the husband does not understand that language of love. And so the husband ends up saying, my wife never loves me. Even though she's screaming at the top of her lungs. But he has not learnt the language of love in Japanese. Now we're not talking about human languages. We're talking about expressions of love. So he in his therapy, he said, these are five languages that we should all learn to recognize. So that in case our spouse is screaming in one language, we should be aware that, okay, that is their language. And we will then appreciate. Also, he says, it is very common that the language you give love in might be different than the language you receive love. You want to give in one language, you want to receive in another. This is the norm or the default. That a lot of times, what you do when you are in love, how you will express love, is different than how you will receive it. So the goal of today's lecture is to go over these five languages so that we understand. Now, which language is right? All of them are right. And all of these five are ways to show love. Even if you don't speak one of these languages, if you show love in them, your partner will understand. The first and the most obvious language of love, and this is the language that everybody begins in, is verbal talk, communication to say, I love you. And there is even a hadith in a dar qutni Sunan al qutni with a slight weakness in his chain, but it is a part of the seerah, and it's not a problem to, do, to mention a hadith about the seerah that have a slight weakness, that Aisha radiallahu anha once asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulallah, kayfa hubbuka bi? How is your love for me? Now pause here. Husbands, one of the things that we are totally clueless about is that women need constant reaffirmation of love. This is human nature. Women want to be reassured constantly. And our Prophet replies, and look at the poetic response. And of course, in Arabic, it sounds even better in English. It's even not bad in English, but he said, like a tight knot means it's permanent. It's always there like a tight knot. Then the hadith goes on that every once in a while, Aisha would tease the process and especially if there's something going on issue. How is the knot right now? Is it still tight? How is the knot right now? So this really shows this is what we call the language of love that you actually have. And also another key point is that there are key phrases that couples have for one another. Phrases that are inside jokes that only they have. And this is a sign of healthy love that even our Prophet had a pet name for Aisha. Do you know this? He had multiple pet names for Aisha. He called her Humayra. He called her Ummi Abdullah and he called her Ya Aish. Aish, she cut off the Tamar Buta. You know, when you just out of love, you change the name a little bit, right? We all do this in our culture, just change the name. Nobody on earth called her Aish other than our Prophet Wasallam. And subhanAllah, this is what we call the language of love. Saying you love your partner, having these inside jokes that, you know, go back to when we were married or something happened or an incident and bringing it up over and over again. And also a lot of us, especially in the cultures that we come from, us men especially, we feel that we are somehow not masculine if we show the soft side to our wives. We feel that we are somehow betraying our masculinity if we really show our wives how much we love them. And honestly, that is not only foolish, it's just not true. It's not only wrong, it's factually incorrect and it's going to harm the marriage. Our Prophet wasallam in a culture that was far more pseudo-macho than ours. Pseudo-macho, it's not real macho, it's pseudo-macho. And nobody mentioned love for women publicly. We all know the famous hadith in Sahih Bukhari when a Bedouin came and he said, Ya Rasulullah, who do you love the most? 
And the interesting point, when our Prophet said this hadith, Aisha is not in the audience. He is not saying what he is saying so that Aisha's ears hears. He is saying this to make a point that in a society which it is taboo for a man to say how much he loves his wife. In a society where people think it's not masculine or something to confess that he loves his wife. In front of the whole masjid where all the major sahaba is there. He says, Aisha. Sure, she wasn't sitting there. Don't you think within 10 minutes the news would have spread all the way back? Don't you think the whole city of Medina would be buzzing? Our Prophet announced his love for Aisha. And how do you think Aisha would feel? Then of course the man becomes flustered. No, no, I didn't mean women. I meant amongst the men. And even then, as we know, he linked the one man whom he knew decades before he married Aisha. He still linked him through Aisha, whom he's only been married to for less than a decade. He said, amongst the men, her father. Even though he knew her father even before she was born. And he knew her father for 40 plus, 50 plus years. But now, the love that he has for Aisha needs to be demonstrated. Dear husbands, there is nothing wrong. In fact, it is Islamic and it is common sense to affirm love verbally for your wife. Saying, I love you never grows old, no matter how old you are. The love should still be young. Now the flip side of this, the opposite side of this is to be negative when you speak, to always put the other party down, to say something that is demeaning or emotionally hurtful. How can a marriage flourish when every second or third statement is meant to hurt the other person? How can a marriage flourish? Be careful. And even if something needs to be said, even if something needs to be pointed out, try to change the language into something positive rather than negative. For example, simple example, and again, I don't want to be too stereotypical, but sometimes let's say the default is in most couples, let's say the wife is going to cook more than the husband, let's say. So let's say the husband is irritated at let's say food isn't being cooked, okay? Rather than saying that can't you ever cook some food? Can't you ever cook a decent meal? Flip it around and say, remember that biryani you made? Biryani is always, mashallah, language of love. That's another language of love, okay? Remember that biryani you made two weeks ago? I really miss it. The same sentiment is done. I really miss that dish that you cooked. Imagine if you said that rather than saying, why can't you cook a good meal? The same sentiment, you miss a meal. You really want that, but you phrase it positively. You put the spin on it. And now perhaps the spouse will be enthusiastic and do it out of genuine love rather than hate and being forced to do it. So the point is that this is what you call words of affirmation. You affirm your love. You say something that is positive. And one of the most important ways to do this is to praise your partner, to say something good about your partner. Husbands, husbands, always compliment your wife. No matter what she's wearing, she says, well, how do you think this looks? The answer is don't think. Do not think at all. Say, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. You have to give good words here, okay? And of course, obviously, I shouldn't say this out too loud, but it's on the microphone, everything. Remember, we are allowed to exaggerate a little bit when it comes to spousal issues, okay? Alhamdulillah. Our Prophet ﷺ said that what a husband and wife say to one another, this hadith in Bukhari, there is no kadib, there's no lying. What does this mean? SubhanAllah, some of our brothers, mashallah, they're so muttaqi, they're so muttaqi. They think they have to be honest when their wives ask them how they look in the dress that they're wearing. No, don't dig your graves that early. Okay? You are allowed to, mashallah, tabarakallah, put some syrup and sugar. And Allah is not going to punish you for love language over here. Okay? And I'm being serious here that, subhanAllah, why do you think our Prophet actually said there is no kadib in a man and a wife, a husband and wife talking with one another? Why do you think he said this? Because he's opening the door. Go ahead and sweet talk one another. Go ahead and say whatever you want. Alhamdulillah, it's good for you, for the marriage. Why do you think he even says this? Because he wants to show you words of affirmation. Wives as well, don't always put your husband's accomplishments down. Like everything has to be a sarcastic thing. No, praise, thank. Say that you appreciate the job promotion. Oh, you only got one raise, not three raises. No. Praise it a little bit more. Even if you are frustrated that only you got one raise after three years, whatever. Praise it. MashaAllah, I support you in the... That one word 
Subhanallah, you will increase his love for you so much by a word of affirmation. Your respect and your support is gonna go light years in his love for you. So both husbands and wives, first language of love is the most obvious tongue. The second language of love, and this is a language that generally speaking, women love to receive, but men find difficult to give, okay? And it is the language of time. This is the language that it shows you care. Why? Because we all have 24 hours in the day. And what you choose to do with those 24 hours shows your priorities. That is obvious, isn't it? Therefore, a woman wants to sh experience love by time. So the wife usually complains that he doesn't spend time with me. And us husbands were like, we come home, you know, at 7 p.m. and we leave the house, whatever, at, you know, 8 p.m. Right there, that's 13 hours a day, multiplied by five, then on the weekend. So he is thinking clock time. But you see, when the wife is asking for time, she's not asking clock time. She is asking attention, attention, quality time, not quantity. You see, we only have one Saturday evening. And if you choose to go play cricket with your friends on Saturday evening, okay, what you've done is you've demonstrated to your wife that you've taken your most choicest time frame, the time frame where you're relaxed, you're calm, she's looking forward to it, let's say, and you're like, no, I'm gonna go and watch the match. I'm gonna go. So she feels slighted, not because of the clock time, but because of quality time. Husbands, when you say to your wife, we will spend this time together, this means the television has to be off. It means the remote has to be away from your hand. I know that's very difficult to let go, especially as the wife is talking, and the, no, that's not quality time. It means the magazine has to be shut, and you have to pay attention, spend actual time. And our Prophet wasallam would spend quality time with his wives every single day and week. Aisha says that even though the general rule he told the Sahaba that try to go to sleep after Isha, in those days they would sleep after Isha, pray the Hajj, wake up for Fajr. Aisha says that the Prophet would speak to me after Isha, meaning at nighttime when everybody else is asleep, he would speak to me until late night. And we all know the famous incident in Sahih Bukhari as well, that our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he famously once told the Sahaba, they were going on a caravan, that he told the Sahaba, you guys go forward and leave me with Aisha. And he then raced her in the desert. He raced her. And the first time, who beat whom? Aisha radiallahu anha beat the Prophet sallallahu Then a few months or a few years later, the same thing happened and he beat her. And then he said, this one makes up for the first one. This is what we call quality time. Literally, he got rid of every other engagement. Literally. This is what we call, when we're talking about time, he told the Sahaba, leave me, give me some time with Aisha. How do you think our mother Aisha felt? How do you think in public, he is giving this time, he's gonna race. And by the way, doing a race, you think you are serious and important? You think it's demeaning for you to play with your wife and children? A'udhu Billah. A'udhu Billah. Our Prophet Sallallahu and he is Rasulullah, the one whom Allah sent the Qur'an down on. And he is playing a race with his wife. Think about that. And when you do a race, what must you do? On your mark, it said, go. We're gonna begin here. We're gonna end there. That's all a part of the race, right? And he's doing that race with Aisha radiallahu anha. This is what we mean by quality time. When our wives ask us, you never spend time with me. This is what they mean. Both partners need to give quality time. And quality time, really it means attention. That's what it means. Language number three is the language of gift giving. The language of giving something to the other. A physical item that is handed over by one to the other. And our Prophet explicitly mentioned this as a language of love in a hadith that is only two words. Tahadu tahabu. Give hadiyah, you will love one another. This is an explicit affirmation that giving hadiyah is a language of love. And giving hadiyah, another difference between men and women, us men, if our wives had, let's just say, a thousand dollars that they're gonna get in a year for a gift for us, us men, we would want that she saves that thousand to that one time of the year and gives us that expensive watch or that tool set or that whatever it is. We want the expensive gift even if it's once every blue moon. Fair enough. Men, wives are not that way. They want frequent gifts even if they're free. A gift that shows you are thinking about them. 
And us husbands, we need to understand our women. Of course, they all love the expensive stuff as well. But if we have a thousand dollars, take a small amount for the big gift and the rest of it divide by maybe 20. And every two weeks, every week, just give something small. And that small gift will sustain the love. Yes, once in a while you need the large gift, the wedding anniversary. If you don't know my position, wedding anniversary is not only halal, it will sustain your marriage. I actually say it is mustahab to do this actually. There's nothing wrong with having a romantic dinner with your wife or something like this. There's nothing wrong with this. But in any case, so it doesn't even have to be monetary. You know, some of the best gifts are not money. For example, if you were to write a card for your wife, Something from the heart, personal, a poem. No matter how cheesy or dumb you think it is, believe you me, it will impact the marriage. Believe you me, it's going to go a long way because it's the thought that counts. Again, us men, we are way too critically over-analytical. We analyze until we stagnate. What if she makes fun of? What if? What if? And in that, we do nothing. No, just do. Just something small, something trivial. And guys, flowers are always in season. No problem. Go give. No problem. You know, I remember I teach I taught a class many years ago and we we're teaching class about the seed and whatnot. One of the sisters said, did our process ever give flowers to our mothers? I said, subhanAllah, dear sister in Arabia, right? In Medina, where do you think flowers are going to come? But I will tell you, and I gave her many romantic examples of them is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi drinking some milk, taking the milk of Aisha and he turned the glass around and where her lips came, he made a point to put the lips, right? Where her lips were, she handed the glass this way. Aisha said he turned it around and he looked at me and where my lips were, he then did that. Something so small, this is what we call romance. Something so trivial. The point is you want to demonstrate to your wife that you're thinking about her, you're loving her. The fourth language of love is the language of helping, the language of chores, the language of doing what is typically the responsibility of the other to do. You see, in every marriage, husband and wife, routine works out. One couple does this, the other couple does that. That's the routine. Every once in a while, each partner should try to do what is reasonable that the other partner typically does. Why? To demonstrate, I'm not taking you for granted. To demonstrate that, I appreciate what you are doing. The stereotypical norm is that women generally do more housework than the men. This is the stereotypical norm. Husbands, if Aisha herself told us عنها, that our Prophet would milk his own goat and he would mend his own shoes and he would cook his own and prepare his own food. Now, Aisha said this, but I asked the women as well, do you think that Aisha would just sit and do nothing? عنها, what she is saying, our Prophet was not a commanding husband. Do this, cook my food, mend my shoes. He was not like that. If something needed to be done and he could do it, he would stand up and do it. Now, do you think that Aisha would just sit and do nothing? No. When she is there, she will do it. But he's not the commanding type. This is the ideal situation. Of course, even in the household of the Prophet ﷺ, our mothers cooked. That's the default. We know this from many a hadith. She would prepare food and put it in front. But he would not be commanding all oh, this and that. And if something needed to be done, he wouldn't say, fetch me water. He would stand up and do it. And if Aisha saw, she would go and do it for him. But he wasn't that commanding type. So it's really important that both husbands and wives, they try to appreciate what the other is doing and not take it for granted. Husbands, if your wife is the one that is regularly cooking, every once in a while, just say, you know what? You're cooking. I see you, mashallah, every day. Today, let's go out. Or even more than this, cook yourself. Point is, there should be give and take. That whatever is the default, right? Suppose, you know, the husband typically does one chore, whether it's the garbage taking, whatever. Once in a while, let the wife take charge and say, I appreciate what you're doing. Our wives, really, they do the bulk and the brunt of the household chores. And it is human nature. After a while, they begin to feel cheapened. They begin to feel like you're just treating me like a servant. All I do is I cook and I clean and I do this. And it's human nature. We would feel the same. And we know this when our wives leave for a week or two and we see how much work they have to do. We are so grateful when they come back. Right? When we have to take charge for that two, three days, it looks like two, three years. Okay? When that bowl doesn't magically disappear and it's still there when we come back. Why did it go away? We just expect it to disappear magically. Right? When the food isn't automatically put in front of us, it just comes from heaven. We actually have to cook. Then we realize how much our women do. Look, what do you expect is going to happen? day in, day out, week in, week out, year in, year out. And especially if you add to this 
children, on taking care of the children and rearing the children. It might even lead to a mental instability if she's not appreciated, right? Agreed, we have our jobs and we're paying for whatnot. Agreed, there's a lot going on there as well. And it's understandable, but it doesn't excuse that we should not take it for granted. Now, flip side as well, women, our sisters, we talked about this issue of chores and responsibilities. Realize one of the languages of love that most women do not appreciate, but men are screaming at the top of their lungs. But women do not hear is the language of taking care of the responsibilities of finances. This is a language of love. Would you give your paycheck 70, 80, 90% to a stranger every single month? The very fact that a man goes to work, spends 80% or more of his income on his family consistently without even one grumble, happily writes, this is the house payment, this is the bills, this is that, this is what I have to do, understands it and doesn't, this is what a man is supposed to do and he does it. This is a language of love that shows we care about this person. Why would we do it if we didn't care? And this is a language of love that the other party, generally speaking, is not receiving. So she is saying, he never says he loves me. He never spends time with me. This means he doesn't love me. And he, for 10 years, 90% of his income is for the house. And she is ignoring this language completely. And he doesn't even realize there's a crisis. Because in his eyes, how can there be a problem? I'm taking care of you, taking care of the kids. Why is there an issue? Because he is screaming the language of love in his Swahili, and she doesn't speak Swahili. She's waiting for the Chinese language. You get my point here, right? So both parties need to understand the languages of love. Dear wives, the very fact that your husband is consistently taking care of the finances, this means he loves you, or else you wouldn't be taken care of. We take our wives, generally speaking, I'm being stereotypical, but again, generally speaking, we take our wives housekeeping for granted. But vice versa, our wives take the house for granted. They take the finances for granted. And we both need to appreciate each other more and understand that that is a language of love, okay? And this leads us to our fifth language of love, and that is the language of the physical touch. And five is 5A and 5B. 5B is obviously the act of intimacy. And that is clearly an aspect of marriage. And it is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to be happy in. This is explicit in the Quran. I started with 5B by the way, because 5A is something we don't think about. I started with 5B. 5B is the act of intimacy. The conjugal act is a very important manifestation. Now, generally speaking, again, I have to be stereotypical, statistically wise, for most men, this is a very important language. And a lot of times in most couples across all cultures, not just Muslim culture, but across the globe, most couples, the man will complain about 5B. I don't get enough of 5B. Okay, I don't get enough of the this language of love. But see, of course, sometimes it's the other way that the wife is complaining, and it's true both ways, but the majority is that the men are complaining. And this is, again, across all cultures. But see, one of the reasons why is that the other four languages and language 5a is not given so when the wife is not getting any of the four and we're gonna come to 5a I'm waiting for it to the end don't worry but I'm trying to explain to you when she is not receiving any language of love she doesn't feel like giving the language of 5b she doesn't feel appreciated 5b the language of intimacy becomes a chore she begins to despise it sometimes oh he only comes to me when he needs me he takes me for complete advantage he has no clue as to the effort the sacrifice the love the dedication he only comes to me for one need of his and it becomes a burden and a chore rather than becoming the most beautiful the most romantic the most intimate why because either the husband is not expressing or she is not understanding the other languages the first four and 5a and now we get to 5a we understand what 5b is that's very clear what is 5a this is a language that women love more than men generally speaking and it deals with the physical touch the physical touch that has nothing to do with 5b the physical touch that is not meant to get to intimacy can you believe and this is a hadith in Abu Dawood and Tirmidhi and other books that our mother Aisha says the first thing the Prophet did when he entered upon us was that he would kiss us this is an authentic hadith just a kiss guys you can actually give a kiss and that's it I know it's shocking to many of you but that's it you can stop right there you don't have to go any more than that a hug just a hug a back massage 
and without going anywhere else, that's it. You don't expect anything more. Guess what? If you don't expect anything more, you might actually get something more. So 5A is just a physical touch that is meant to show that you appreciate her. And in fact, a survey was done by this author who did this book, that a survey was done that the majority of men only touch their wives when they're expecting the full way. And this survey demonstrated that most women then begin to find that touch repulsive. They don't want to be touched then. That's the only reason. They start feeling used. They start feeling that, oh, you only want me for that. And therefore we need to break this barrier. And that is why even we learn from the hadith in Bukhari that every time our Prophet went home, before he entered his house, he would do the miswak. Our scholars say, so that his breath was fresh. Why do you think his breath has to be fresh when he enters the house? Think about it, okay? Whether it's a peck on the cheek, whether it is kiss, whether it is a hug, something that is just a touch that is not necessarily sexual in nature. You want your wife to love you, wife you want your husband to love you as well. You need to express these languages of love. This is what you call the perfect marriage.